Luke Jones joining us here, talking all things fish. We know the fish stink, uh, Luke. We'll get to them in a minute. But how about this 53 with the Ravens? And how about this left guard situation? I, you know, uh, we're not ones to like, I mean, you were on the secondary for years. Uh, we know the linebacking core. There's some question marks here. They've kept a few uh, defensive linemen, fewer than maybe we thought. But the, the left guard situation, this is a little disconcerting, right, that the organization said six months. We'll make fun of Miami and all their trades and everything they gave up on last week, but the Ravens believe they're a playoff team. To leave this left guard thing as unsettled as it is, it's a little weird of them going into opening day, sort of, we don't know what we're doing yet. Yeah, and John Harbaugh said on Monday that they have made a decision, but of course did his, why would we disclose that information? Why would we give... Uh, anyone an advantage uh, with us doing that, which, okay, I mean, (laughs) as much as the Miami Dolphins are rebooting, reloading, rebuilding, tanking, whatever you want to call it, I don't think any of the options at left guard is that that, that they're going to change what they're doing to to see who that's going to be. But uh, it's uh, it's a big concern. It's a big question mark. I'll remind everyone, uh, and I wrote about this at WNST.net to start the week, the Ravens, the last time they entered a season with, un- with such uncertainty at that specific position, go back to 2012. Do you remember who started the, the 2012 opener, that Monday night game uh, against the Cincinnati Bengals uh, to start what ultimately culminated with the Super Bowl? Do you remember who started at left guard that night? It was not Andre G- Girard, was it? <clears throat> no, no, no. That, uh, Andre Girard was with, with, with the team the previous year. The starting left guard that night, was someone who had never played in the NFL over his I saw Vladimir Dukas running around. I mean, I'm just thinking of who was... <laughs> yeah. I got all Ramon these names. Ramon Harewood was the starting Ramon left guard that night. Harewood. No one anticipated that. And part of it was, remember, they had reshuffled. They had put McKinney on the bench. Michael Orr had gone to left tackle. Kelechi Osemele, who had been a candidate at left guard, he winds up at right tackle. Long story short, it's not to say this is ideal. Uh, or uh, something where you just look at it and say, well, it means the Ravens are going to win the Super Bowl. We, we know that this isn't an ideal situation, but it is a reminder to say that even serious contenders can go into a season with a major question mark at any given position, other than maybe quarterback. Uh, well, the Ravens had a question at left tackle the entire season and then won, won, went and won the Super Bowl with Brian McKinney, right? Literally. Right, right. So, uh, I mean, that season they went from Harewood to Bobby Williams for a while, Ja Reed, uh, and then ultimately they decided uh, to, to put Brian McKinney back in the left tackle spot, shifted Orr back to right tackle, put Osemele at left guard, and the rest was history. Uh, we, we know what happened after that. But... It very much is a big question right now, and I think what makes this difficult from uh, my perspective is how do you really handicap it? I mean, they talked about James Hurst being their fallback option all summer, but up until the time that they closed practices to the media, which wasn't that terribly long ago, James Hurst hadn't taken a single rep at left guard. So if he hasn't practiced there all summer, do you just throw him in there? You know, Bradley Bozeman was playing uh, a lot of left guard late uh, in the summer, but then he started at right guard uh, in the preseason finale. Or, uh, bo- or it feels like right Bozeman's guard. the guy they want to play. Now, whether he can and, and you know, it feels like they're, they're trying to give him a job, right? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I, I mean, I think you can say that, but then Ben Powers played left guard in the preseason finale, and, you know, you still throw Patrick McCarry, uh, who made the 53-man roster. I feel less less inclined to see him uh, as the starting left guard to begin the season, but uh, I think of Hurst, Bozeman, and Powers, you can make a, a reasonable argument on any of those three, but certainly you wouldn't view any of those three as a, quote, established starter, which John Harbaugh kind of talked about a little bit last week, the difference between a starter and an established starter. They don't have an established starter, and I'm not sure they're going to have one they might not have one all year at left guard. It might be a position where they're kind of rotating, not series to series, but it might be a week-to-week kind of proposition, depending on health, depending on performance. But uh, I think what's disconcerting about that is, if you recall, it was Hurst and Bozeman sharing time at left guard at the end of last season, and that left guard position was a major problem for them against the Chargers in that playoff loss. So... Uh, as much as we spent time talking about Jermaine Illuminor and the possibility of a trade, which 
could still happen at some point, but certainly at this point, if you're bringing in a left guard, you'd be skeptical that they'd be ready for the Dolphins. So you're going into week one with uh, maybe not a mystery to the Ravens, but certainly a mystery to the outside world and definitely a mystery on how effective that player is going to be. So, so I'm, not, I'm not really sure who it's going to be. Again, I could see it being James Hurst. I could see it being Bradley Bozeman. I could see it being Ben Powers. And I think in a perfect world, Nestor, with, with Ben Powers being a, a fourth-round pick, I think you'd love to see him kind of have an Orlando Brown Jr. track where doesn't necessarily begin the season as a starter, but about halfway through the year, maybe shows enough growth that he can settle into that spot and then he can be the guy there. Doesn't mean he'll be a Pro Bowl player. I mean, Orlando Brown isn't that guy just yet uh, by any means, but has stabilized that right tackle position that was a question mark going into last year. So I think if you're looking for a prediction on, say, who might be the left guard in Week 10, I think you'd really like it to be Ben Powers based on his draft status and based on what the Ravens thought of him. But Asking a fourth-round rookie to be ready week one to, to handle that a starting job, that's a lot to ask. So uh, it's tough to say. Uh, even a week ago, I would have said Bradley Bozeman, like, like you're suggesting. But, uh, again, in that preseason finale, understanding that the veterans rested, so I, I don't know how much you can take away from it, but they did have Ben Powers at left guard that night. So uh, trying to figure this thing out uh, has not been easy, to say the least. He is Luke Jones, all of our WNST coverage. And, of course, we have Baltimore Positive coming this week. We are doing Reverend Al Hathaway at Jennings Cafe in Catonsville this week. We're going to be back at State Fair next week as well. Fadley's is shut down this week. They take a vacation during the Labor Day week to uh, start the football season. So uh, we'll be back at Fadley's later on in the month. You can learn all about our Baltimore positive stuff. You're going to hear from Dick Cassie or WNST all week long. You're going to hear from Ron Shapiro all week long and all of our Baltimore positive coverage. Uh, rocking and rolling at BaltimorePositive.com. Lots of things ahead as well. Charles Newson off at Sons in Parksville. Uh, Parkville. Go see Sydney. My man, he's got my, my wife's ring. She, he fixed her, her wedding band. It kind of like broke. And um, you, you need an artist. That's what they do at uh, Charles Newsom off the Sons in Parksville. Parkville, go find them uh, as well. And uh, I know Sid's listening out there, so go Mets is all I can say for him. Full Circle, we trust Dave and our friends at Full Circle Tire with all of our auto repair and maintenance needs up in Hartford County. You'll love that 1995 oil change. you find them up at North Fountain Green Road in Bel Air at 410 676 Cars. Also find them at on their Facebook page at Full Circle Tire and Auto. Also our friends at Johnny D's. I'm waiting for the shrimp salad. Peter DeLutis keeps saying we're going to have a, a business lunch over there next week, so I'm looking forward to that. Say hello to Johnny D's, where they are, like everybody else, like us, Luke, awaiting Ravens football season on a mosque uh, right up here just uh, south of Towson. They'll, they'll, they might call that uh, lower WNST area down off Lock Raven, Lock Raven Road, Lock Raven Boulevard. All right, so, Luke, let's, uh, let's get back into this, this Ravens side of things and moving the ball and Lamar Jackson. What did you learn from sitting out there in the heat the last five weeks and watching them toss it around. I, I know from watching these preseason games, we don't learn much. It feels to me like they're trying to really get him accurate inside 15 yards, right? Like these fast passes, these decisions, these Hayden Hurst can beat a guy off the line of scrimmage or, you know, Andrews can get uh, and make, make somebody miss, that it feels like those are the type of passes that he has improved upon. Am I right or wrong? Well, I mean, I, I think just in general he looked a lot better. And that's not to say that he's going to be a 5,000-yard passer or throw 40 touchdown passes. I mean, I don't think, uh, frankly, I don't think Lamar Jackson's ever going to be that kind of a proficient pocket pass, passer. For one thing, his skill set lends itself to not having to do that. I mean, uh, in a perfect world, yeah, you want him to be more efficient from the pocket, and I think he has the ability to do that. Uh, I think he's shown uh, improved accuracy. Uh, I think... The mechanics have been much sharper, more consistent, and he just he's looked more comfortable back there. Now, what does that mean when the live bullets of the regular season start and you're playing the New England Patriots or you're playing the Pittsburgh Steelers? Uh, I mean, but that time will tell because there's always a lot of muscle memory uh, involved when you're talking about tweaking mechanics, whether you're talking about a pitcher, a quarterback, whatever. I mean, a free throw shooter. I mean, it, there's definitely. Uh, something to be said about what it looks like when 
the, the legitimate real lights come on. Uh, so well, he's also still, a guy that never was really taught all of that because, to your point, that wasn't what they did, right? I mean, like three, four years ago, he's, he's leaps and bounds. We're talking about a kid that's 21, 22 years old, right? Sure, sure. But, but I'll also remind everyone, this is a Heisman Trophy winner who did throw the ball plenty in college. I mean, he ran it a ton. We know that. And he's still going to run it a lot. I mean, we, we understand that. I, I think there's a fine balance with Lamar Jackson between wanting him to become more efficient as a passer, more accurate as a passer. Uh, the success that he did have over the middle of the field last year, I, I think that's going to continue to be their bread and butter, to your point, uh, with Mark Andrews, you're hoping with Hayden Hurst, uh, I think certainly with Willie Sneed over the middle of the field. And now you've added some weapons uh, that you think can make plays on the outside uh, with Miles Boykin and Marquise Brown kind of all over the field uh, that you have some guys that can hopefully create some mismatches and create some open throws for Lamar Jackson that don't have to be 100% pinpoint accurate as long as it's close, as long as it's within the catch radius of uh, a six foot four wide receiver uh, like a Miles Boykin. You know, I mean, that's, well, as long as they go want. up in the air and become six the other way, too, right? Right, right. So, but, uh, you know, in the case of a Miles Boykin, you're hoping that you get a little bit of an effect, not that he'll become the same receiver, but let's face it, go back and look, even in that 2012 postseason, it's not as though Joe Flacco was throwing dimes that were perfectly 100% accurate. You had guys like Dennis Pitta and Anquan Bolden making uh, catches that, you know, with the, the catch radius and going up and getting the ball and, and making a spectacular catch. I mean, it, comes, it goes hand in hand. You want your quarterback to deliver passes that are accurate, but at the same time, you want pass-catching targets that can go up and make a play for you as well. So uh, that's why there is hope, even though expectations should be tempered on guys like Miles Boykin. And you know, Marquise Brown isn't going to go up and make – you know, uh, you know, is it going to show a major vertical or anything like that, but still has the uh, ability to make spectacular catches. You want that. You want that from the tight end position. Mark Andrews fits that description. And you hope you get something that is a, a more productive, more consistent passing game. And, and I think th- there was enough evidence in the preseason and in training camp to be optimistic about that. Now, what does that look like statistically? I think remains to be seen because – this team didn't give Mark Ingram $6.5 million guaranteed at signing to, to just be in a timeshare. I mean, he's going to be a feature back. They still have Gus Edwards. Uh, I think Justice Hill is very intriguing in how he looked, not just with his speed, which was advertised, but some of the physicality, some of the broken tackles for a 200-pound back, pretty impressive. So I think he, his workload early on is going to be interesting to me as far as how much uh, involvement he has even though he's number three on the depth chart right now. But, but ultimately, all these different issues we talk about on either side of the ball, and we've already talked about left guard, we'll talk about the pass rush, I'm sure, here in a few moments, but <laughs> it, it begins and ends with the progress and improvement of Lamar Jackson. And based on what we've seen, understanding its training camp, understanding its fake football preseason games, but also acknowledging that Lamar Jackson hasn't been able to play a game that matters. So... You can't judge him and say, well, none of that stuff matters. It matters, but now we take it to a much more meaningful degree and we see if all that growth and improved accuracy, more consistency that we saw over the course of the summer, if that translates and carries over. And I'm inclined to think it will. Uh, Is it going to be dramatic uh, improvement? That's where the question lies, and that's where you really start to ponder what the ceiling is because – if he makes some really meaningful improvement and he looks like a different passer uh, out there compared to how he looked in November and December, then boy, then the Ravens really could have something really special here, not just in 2019, but over the next few years. He is Luke Jones. He is Bolt. Tomorrow, Luke on Twitter and, of course, Luke at WNST.net. We get full coverage from Owings Mills all week. I will be in Miami this weekend. And, of course, Tuesday night at Green Mount Station with Matt Skura Center. We will uh, be talking about this offense and moving things around. We had Matt out of Patrick's in Essex last year. We'll be in Hampstead, Carroll County, on Tuesday night with Matt Skura. We'll also be at Adams Jeep up in uh, Aberdeen. We've been talking to Galen and the folks up there. You can follow them on Twitter at Adams Jeep. We'll be doing that 
probably a little later on in the month, 410-879-5800, and you can learn all about what they do up there. So we've got some live shows out, all of them brought to you by our friends at Friedmont Mortgage, and of course, Carl Delmont will be here talking about the market this week, as well as the Harrisburg Heat. It is football season. Now, you know, you talk about Lamar, you talk about this offense and throwing the football, he's not going to throw for 5,000 yards, all of that. This is where Greg Roman comes in, and this is where the offense and maybe the mindset of where they were in March or April, where they were after the draft, where they are with Hollywood Brown and Miles Boykin and some weapons that maybe they didn't see in their, in their mind in March. Do you think they are going to throw the ball more? Like I, th- There's a part of this for me where I'm thinking, if the thing's ever going to grow up and be really successful... Every time you snap the ball, the thought of my quarterback running into a linebacker, that, that's human nature for me to say, let's let him throw it more, and then we'll run it when we have to. I know that's not what their mindset is, but when Greg Roman has some weapons and has a quarterback that he feels like they've groomed to throw the ball, they know he can run. I'd be shocked if they don't throw it a little bit more than maybe we looked at last November where he was sort of thrown into the fire. I mean, we're 10 months further along now. I think he's more prepared to throw the football now. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree on that. And and let's be very clear. There's still going to be a run-first offense. I still anticipate that they're going to be first or second, let's say, uh, because you never quite know, but first or second in the league in terms of rushing attempts per game. I mean, I, I think they're still very much going to be zigging while everyone else is zagging because uh, all analytics tell you in this day and age is it's about the passing game. But that said, I do think they are going to throw the ball more frequently than they did last year. And I I think the difference is, and and I don't want to say this in a disparaging way about Lamar Jackson for what he did last year because he was never someone that was identified as that they expected him to play in 2018. I mean, the Ravens kept Robert Griffin III as an extra backup quarterback to Joe Flacco, and the thought was that Jackson was that was going to be not a complete redshirt year because we know that they tried some of the gadget plays, and he was on the field for five or six, seven plays a game uh, early in the season before Flacco got hurt, but he was never expected to be the guy. So when he came in, for me, it felt way more of a – he wasn't the guy. It wasn't his offense. And to say he was along for the ride, that would be wildly unfair because what he did running the ball uh, spoke for itself. Whether you like the risk they were taking with that or not, it was a Well, they played football they in January. They had a home game. You know what yeah, I mean? exactly. Like, it was a big part of what they did, but, but it never really felt like Lamar is the guy, that, that it was – his huddle, that he was in full command. It was much more a case of, you know, it, it was so complimentary, everything they did in running the ball and, and playing the style of defense that they were able to play, and they were so, so successful there, and the special teams. And it was all just very complimentary, whereas I feel like this year, it's, clearly, uh, it, it's clear when you watch it, Lamar Jackson is comfortable. He's in command of the huddle. This is his team now, and uh, that's a really exciting thing, uh, but it's also a thing that can make you nervous when you remember, hey, th- this guy's 22. I mean, he's still really, really young, but, but that's, that's something to be optimistic about with the idea that, hey, he wasn't a finished product last November. He wasn't a finished product uh, in that playoff loss, and good thing, too, because uh, in that playoff loss, he, he, he wasn't very good, uh, to say the least, but I think with the growth that he's shown with Greg Roman implementing an offense that, that's kind of been built around Lamar Jackson from the ground up. You're going to see a lot of running the ball still, of course, but I think you're going to see a heck of a lot of play action coming off of those designed runs. And, and I think what we have to remember is defenses will always have to account for his mobility, for his ability to run, and that's going to continue to help uh, the likes of Mark Ingram and Gus Edwards and Justice Hill in the running game, but it also helps you so much when you get into play action and RPOs uh, and just pass coverage in general. I mean, think about it. How much can an opposing defense play man-to-man coverage when you have to be peeking into the backfield to see if Lamar Jackson's taking off and running? So that kind of lends itself to having to play a little more zone coverage and when you have zone, what does that allow you to be able to do? To scheme open receivers into windows where you have some wide open throws for Jackson. Going back to the accuracy question where 
if there's a guy that's wide open in, in, uh, into a, sitting into a window in his own, then Lamar doesn't have to make a perfectly accurate, perfect throw. As long as it's a reasonably accurate throw, there you go. You're moving the chains. You're moving the ball down the field. So uh, he, he's, they're definitely going to throw the ball more than they did last year. I'd be surprised if, if you don't see a spike there. But they're still going to run the ball way more frequently than uh, I, I venture to guess any other offense in the league. And it might be any other offense in the league by a pretty wide margin. But I, I think based on practice, and again, they don't show us that much in practice, especially now uh, as we get into regular season mode, but they worked way too much on their passing game. They worked, Lamar Jackson worked way too much on refining his mechanics and improving his footwork and just working to be a better passer for them to just line up week one and say, oh, we're just going to do what we did in, say, week 14 last year. I, I think everyone understands and realizes that you know, what they did last year was a heck of a lot of fun. It was weird. We talked about embracing the weirdness and kind of doing something so different. Uh, they're still going to be doing something different. Uh, there, there's no question about that. But I think it's going to be much more refined. It's going to be expanded. And I think you're going to see more responsibility on the shoulders of Lamar Jackson. And I think the Ravens privately are really excited about that. Now, all this talk that we've heard about being revolutionary – Time will tell about that. Uh, I, I've seen too many years of Ravens offense with too many, uh, too many different characters uh, on the coaching staff and uh, players on the field to, to, to be ready to call something revolutionary. But uh, I do think it has the potential to... If it works, it's different. revolutionary, right? I mean, literally, yeah. if, all I keep thinking about is like Kurt Warner, right? Like playing sort of this indoor football game and I when this is successful I think it's going to look like that I think it's going to look like a crossing route to Hollywood and nobody can catch him for 42 you know what I mean or somebody falls down or blown coverages or confusion about who's got who which always happens you, you know in this RPO right so yeah yeah uh, I mean I, I think there's the potential I mean really what this feels like to me with the play action with RPOs uh, with all of those different things they're going to do where defenses have to account for either a running back running the ball or on every play, Lamar Jackson taking off, what you're hoping is you're going to get a lot of busted plays where there's going to be someone running down the field 20 yards with no one even around them. And we saw a little bit of that. Remember the first preseason game, there was that 30-yard completion to Chris Moore, but the difference now is you're going to have a Marquise Brown out there. Miles Boykin runs very well. Uh, they, they have a, a Justice Hill out of the backfield who had the fastest 40 time of any running back at the Combine uh, back in the winter. So uh, there is more speed on this offense, which wasn't the case last year other than Jackson pretty much. So there's more speed, and with Greg Roman, with everything being – kind of based off of the running game, the running game still being the foundation of this offense, you're just hoping to create mismatches and create busted coverages uh, and things of that nature. And then when you have that, it's going to be on Lamar Jackson to be able to deliver an accurate enough football to capitalize on that. And I think the Ravens feel optimistic, feel excited that that's going to happen far more frequently now uh, than it did uh, late last season. Luke, we've been here long enough that the lava in the sporticulture lava lamp is almost starting to flow, so it's almost like regular season. Love for everybody to see our friends out at Sporticulture. They send flowers, but they also have all sorts of novelties, including my lava lamp, which I it, it's getting a little warm. It's it's a little hot to the touch once I get going. Find them at sporticulture.com. Our friends at Roos Chris hosted us at Pier 5. They can host you up in Owings Mills or Annapolis or Odenton or anywhere you are for a perfect steak, a perfect night out. We were there for a perfect night with uh, Dick Cash. You can check that out out in the buy at Toyota.com, Audio Vault, as well as everywhere, all of our WNST coverage and our Baltimore positive stuff this week. We're with Reverend Al Hathaway over at Jennings. I'm going to have a Jennings burger on Thursday. Uh, we've also got upcoming guests. Ben Jealous is joining us. Uh, Ron Shapiro was part of our program last week at Fadley's. You can check that out at Baltimore Positive as well. I'm wearing my Curio hat. I had Brian Sander off on last week talking about all sorts of whole 
holistic wellness. Uh, they have the spa there, and of course, full service and, f- and incredibly knowledgeable staff about all things cannabis and Cannabis 101. The Curio Wellness Center. Learn about the Curio Way. I've got the O of the hat up as well. I would show my hair, but my hair is getting kind of long, and um, my friends Faith and um, and Brian, everybody, everybody at, at Hammer and Nails, um, they're, they're going to be upset that my hair doesn't look good. So I'm going to go hair hatless later on in the week, take my curio hat off, because Brad and the folks at Hammer and Nails want to get me a haircut. Manicure, pedicure, man cave, they've been inviting me over. They're in Owings Mills. I'm in Owings Mills every Wednesday. I have no excuses to not be getting my hair tuned up this season at Hammer and Nails. So you'll see me over there. Big thanks to Brad and everybody at Hammer and Nails. Luke, uh, you know, back on to, to the field. We haven't talked about the defense at all, but offensively, just with the weapons that they have and what we've seen from Holly, is there a thing about Hollywood that you've seen him turn those jets on at any point? Because the fans haven't yet, right? I mean, it was about catching the ball and getting under punts, and it looked like he was a little nervous last week, the whole deal, right? But have you seen anything that makes you say, wow, that this is some sort of little weapon they're going to, uh, they're, they're going to uh, break out in the third quarter against Miami? We're all going to flip out when we see it? Well, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, I hope we've seen the last of him returning punts anytime soon, because that did not look good. <laughs> and in fairness, Looked like he had never done it in his life. It, in fairness to Marquise Brown, I don't think he had done that since junior college or high school. Uh, he, there was a reason he didn't, didn't do it at Oklahoma. I mean, let's face it, colleges, <laughs> you know, college football programs, if they have a, uh, a blinding, fast kind of guy like he is, they're going to have you doing everything, and he wasn't returning punts at Oklahoma, and I think we saw why. He just did not look comfortable doing that. But to answer your question, he certainly flashed, and I still think he's not 100% full speed, full, you know, pain-free, maybe not pain, discomfort-free on certain cuts. And I think that was always to be anticipated when you're talking about someone coming back from a Liz Frank. And by the way, that's kind of a terrible thing for a kid that, you know, you talk about, you know, horse in the stable, kid getting hurt, kid's got speed, kid's trying to prove that he belongs, you know, he doesn't pass the eyeball test. None of us look at him and say, well, you know, he's 6'4". I mean, so trying to prove yourself and going out there and doing it when you're hurt, Man, that's that's just a tough spot to put a young person in. I, I, you know, and I've seen this. This is thirty-five years of me watching this. That they they might want to shut him down for a month and let him come back when he can really do it. You know, like I, and maybe that that'll wind up happening. Maybe he won't wind up playing so much in the next couple of weeks. Well, I, and and I don't think it's a case of shutting him down. I, I think he's I think he's healthy from the standpoint of he's looks completely fine straight line speed and that's where you see the speed i mean to ask you know to answer your question uh, that you posed a couple moments ago that's where you say yeah that's the guy that i watched at oklahoma who <laughs> could take a you know a bubble screen or you know anything like that and just turn on the jets and he's just running at a different gear than everyone else now the difference is a little bit different in the nfl where okay he still has a, a higher gear than everyone else in the NFL, and Marlon Humphreys talked about that. Uh, so many of the defensive players have talked about that, uh, and that's so Marlon with, Humphrey can't catch him. Yeah, well, that's just with, uh, but that's talking about a defense seeing him in practice and understanding that you know, he wasn't even practicing at the very beginning of training camp just yet. So, so I, I think the change of direction, the cuts, uh, you know, some of those types of movements, he's probably still not one hundred percent, and that's not to say that there's. You know, fear of a setback or, or a re-injury, it's just, uh, you know, is the explosiveness all the way there, uh, all the way back? Is the discomfort all gone at this point? And I think, I think the Ravens privately would say yeah, there's still a little bit of that that he's working with because they were still managing his practice workload uh, even at the end of August. But uh, I think the real question, and this is what you mentioned, and I think it's spot on, and John Harbaugh even acknowledged this a little bit, uh, in his first Monday press conference of the year, is that he missed a heck of a lot of time. I mean, it is a challenge for any rookie uh, in the NFL, period, but certainly at the wide receiver position where we know that very volatile, there are frequent busts in the, in the first round, there's a major learning curve for what NFL wide receivers do compared to what they do in college. And he just didn't get a Which lot is of why so many of them fail, quite frankly, right? Sure, sure. 
but he just didn't get a lot of reps. And that's not to say that he won't contribute. That's not to say he won't be able to make some plays against Miami. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. But I do think it's naive to think that he's just going to come in and be a 70-snap-per-game starter right off the bat. I think you're going to see them work him in. It might be a package of plays. Uh, It might be certain formations. It might be certain routes that he feels more comfortable running. But uh, I think it's going to be a case where they're going to have to be, and John Harbaugh used the word vigilant in asking what they're going to ask him to do, things that he can do well. So it's going to be a challenge. But on the flip side, again, I think he's full go physically in terms of straight line speed. Uh, I think he's getting closer to being full go uh, in terms of cuts and change of direction, in terms of really having that, that highest gear possible. I think he's getting closer and closer to that. So if you have that, even if you only have him out on the field for 20, 25, 30 plays, whatever it winds up being early on, then opponents have to account for that. And he's really fast, and he, he has good hands. That, that's another thing that I have been impressed with. This guy catches the football, punts notwithstanding. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't seen him drop very many passes in practices, so you want that to carry over. But he's the kind of guy that you have to account for. In the same way that we talk about Lamar Jackson, every time with the run you have an edge player, uh, even if the, the ball is a, you know, even if it's a dive to Gus Edwards or now Mark Ingram, uh, an inside run, that edge player cannot just crash inside. Why? Because he knows there's a possibility of Lamar Jackson keeping the ball at the mesh point and taking off. And then you have a 20-yard or, yard or more gain uh, for, for the offense. So uh, in the same way, Marquise Brown, even if he's not on, on the field for every single snap to begin the year, even if they're working him along gradually and slowly, and a lot of that just has to do with fully grasping the offense, he's the kind of guy that you're not going to put your number three corner on. He's the kind of guy that you're not going to have safeties just completely ignore. I mean, he can absolutely blow the top off a defense, and defenses have to account for that. So whether that means they devote more attention to him and that opens up some uh, you know, some playmaking ability for uh, a Miles Boykin or for a Mark Andrews or whoever it might be, that's, that's something you need to take advantage of. That's something that the Ravens feel they can exploit. So even if it isn't firing on all cylinders for Hollywood Brown week one, uh, I think there's uh, enough optimism that he's far enough along, certainly physically, but enough along Uh, as far as his knowledge of the offense and just being more acclimated, that he can still be a factor, even if it's not 70 snaps a game where he's the clear number one wide receiver. He is Luke Jones. He is Baltimore Luke out on Twitter and Luke at WNST.net. You'll find him all week long at Owings Mills. We'll be in Miami this weekend and ignoring the Orioles. We were not ignoring the Orioles. We're just emphasizing the Ravens around here. You know, I mentioned Matt Skurr out at the Greenmount Station, and we'll be having some big crab cakes up in Carroll County. We had him over at Patrick's in Essex. I want to give a shout-out to my friends over at Patrick's, my old stomping grounds right on Eastern Avenue. The cold beer, the great bands. Kids are back at school. Got a bar right in the neighborhood. Great dinner. Thursday night steak dinner to celebrate the start of football season. Just eleven ninety nine. Tacos on Monday. Shrimp on Tuesday. Wings on Wednesday. It's Patrick's in Essex. Make sure you uh, stop and say hello to our friends down there. Lee Tessier is uh, trying to sell my condo. And... Uh, been on the market a little while now. If, uh, if you need to sell your home, I have a dear friend of mine just listed his home with Lee Tessier. Lee's become a friend of mine through the leukemia world, through my wife's battle a few years ago. The Lee Tessier team at Tessier Real Estate can give you an instant cash offer in your home. Get your home sold, guaranteed at a price and a deadline you agree to. Give Lee a call, 410-638-9555, or go to LeeTessier.com to learn more. Royal Farm Chicken Palooza is over. I didn't get the shirt. i am talked to Frank Schilling about that, but I do have the Kona blend in my cup. Royal Farms, real fresh, real fresh, real fast, and the uh, tasty fried chicken. I actually was uh, hungry when I went up to Hootie the Blowfish last week. I stopped at the Royal Farms up in the Hunt Valley, picked up some Western fries. I only had Western fries twice this summer. I had a lot more snowballs than I had Western fries. Spicy delights, but love me some Western fries. The waffle sandwich is now available as well at Royal Farms. Stop in, gas up. Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. 
our sponsor. The buyatoyota.com audio vault is there 24 hours a day from anywhere in the world. You're going to hear from all of our great guests. I'm catching up with everybody getting ready for this Miami game this weekend. Football season brings out the best of me at Baltimore Positive, and Don Moeller and I are going to be out in Catonsville at Jennings with Reverend Al Hathaway later on this week. we got Ben Jealous next week. We're going to be at State Fair. So it's good stuff. Baltimore Positive with Dick Cass and Ron Shapiro this week. It is the newest wing of our WNST mothership. I am Nestor. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Snapchat and Nasty at WNST.net finds me anytime, anywhere. Subscribe to our morning newspaper. We have revamped it, revitalized it. We got Baltimore Positive in there, all Luke's columns in there, all my stuff's in there. I'm going to be writing more in football season. It is the morning newspaper. It's all brought to you by Planet Fitness and PlanetFitness.com, where it's always $5 down, 10 bucks a month to get you in the best shape of your life, even though it's not bikini season anymore. I'm going to use that in Miami this week. Last but never least, breaking news. You know it happens anytime, anywhere. Orioles calling guys up. Ravens shifting around their 53. You'll get it all first on the WNST Tech Service. It is our best service now going in crazily into our 13th year of the WNST Tech Service. And every one of them has been brought to you by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. You know Dennis Colazzo is going to be fired up Thursday from 3 until 5. He'll be here. The SSV on WNST, as well as joining me for breakfast earlier in the week. And, of course, Coons Ford Security Boulevard, always doing it. Big weekend they had, the Labor Day weekend. Still sail on. Dan will be here on Thursday to tell you about it on the SSV on WNST. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Taos in Baltimore. We got fish on our mind, a fish fry in Miami. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Taos in Baltimore. And we never stop talking. Baltimore sports.